Hello, everyone, and welcome back. In the previous video, we introduced the first of a few different techniques that we can use to simplify integrals that might involve transcendental functions. That was integration by parts. In today's video, we're going to introduce some new other methods that can be used to simplify, in particular, trigonometric integrals. Now, I wish that I could give you just some grand unified theory, something like what we did with the integration by parts method, but unfortunately, it's not that simple. There is no real grand unified theory if you see an integral involving maybe sines and cosines. But what I can do and what I will do today is introduce you to a few methods that can be used depending on the type of integral that you see. And what we're going to see over and over again is that we can use those trigonometric identities that we know and love in order to simplify a lot of trigonometric integrals and bring them into something that is much more manageable. So let me go ahead and get started. So the first type of integral that we're going to focus on today is an integral uh, involving powers of sines and cosines. So for example, let's consider an integral Everything will be indefinite today as the, the definite integrals are handled in exactly the same way. So we're just gonna keep our, our lives simple. It will involve the nth power of sine and the nth power of cosine. And in this case, m and n are uh, non-negative integers. So zero and up. Well, in this case, we have three different uh, cases that we can break this into. So the first case is if m is odd. And if m is odd, by definition of an odd number, we can write, we can write m is equal to 2k plus 1 for some other integer uh, k. This is the definition of an odd number. It's one more than an even number. And we can also use the trigonometric identity, the Pythagorean identity. So sine squared uh, of x is equal to one minus cos squared of x. And so in this case, we get sine of m of x, so I'll show you how this simplifies and then I'll show you what it looks like when you put it into the integral. We'll also do tons of examples, so don't worry. This becomes sine of the 2k plus one power, which we can consider as sine raised to the kth power, uh, sorry, the, the sine squared raised to the kth power multiplied by sine of x. So what I did, the two is still left in there, the k is just pulled up front, so I have the sine squared isolated. And I took the one on the end and I just wrote it out at the back. And then the Pythagorean identity tells me that this is one minus cos squared of x, all to the power of k times sine of x. And so why is this important? Well, then we can do a substitution. So this tells us that sine I'll write it as 2k plus one of x cos of x dx. Well, if we let say u equal to cos of x, then this gives us du is equal to minus sine of x, uh, sorry, dx. And we can see from right here, we already have a sine of x that's coming out. And so this leaves us with a minus that's coming from the substitution and one minus cos squared to the power of K that becomes one minus U squared all to the power of K. And then the last cosine, uh, you have, sorry, cosine to the N, you get U to the N here, DU. Now this may look intimidating, but it's actually not bad at all. And why is it not bad? Well, now it's just polynomial. You can expand it out depending on what K is, depending on what N is, you expand this thing out and boom, you've got yourself a polynomial to work with. So you can actually do the same thing when N is odd. So if N is odd, so the power on cosine 
you basically repeat that process, but just do it with, um, with uh, substitution for sine instead. So we write instead this time, n is equal to 2k plus one. Uh, and we use the Pythagorean identity again to show that we get cos of n of x is equal to, in this case, cos squared of x. So I'll skip the first step like I did up there with the sine cos of x, which is equal to one minus sine squared of x all to the power of k multiplied by cos of x. And in this case now, you're going to see that you can substitute for sine. So I'm not going to do the whole integral. We'll do it with examples, but I'm just going to write down the recipe. And we can substitute u is equal to uh, sine of x, which gives you du is equal to cos of x dx, which this cos right here on the end is going to take care of, and the rest of it's in terms of signs, and life is good. Now, I looked at the case where either one of the m or n is odd. So the final case is where both of these are even. So m and n are even. In this case, uh, things are slightly more complicated, but what we will do is we can simplify. And again, I'll, I'll illustrate with examples. Uh, we can simplify with the double angle formulas. So in fact, we know that sine squared of x is equal to one minus cos of two x over two. And we know that cos squared of x is equal to one plus cos of two x over two. And that would give us, so we, because m and n are even, we can extract a power of two out of them. We can replace everything with a cos of two x now. Uh, and, and all of the powers now become powers of, of cos of two x over and over. So you get this polynomial and cos of two x. And then what you can do is you can start simplifying, potentially using the previous methods. So it's one thing for me to just talk about this. And I know that these are, these are very, very vague recipes. Let me do some examples. Let me show you this in action. Let me show you the principles that are underlying a lot of this. So let's do examples. We'll try and illustrate an example of each case. Let's do sine cubed of x cos of x dx, uh, sorry, cos squared of x. In this case, m is odd. So what we will do is we will do the following. We'll do sine squared of x, cos squared of x, sine of x. Now, the reason I'm throwing that extra factor of sine of x on the end is because we know that after we do the substitution, that sine of x is going away with the dx. OK. Then we use Pythag the Pythagorean identity. And so we get this, we substitute for sine squared. And now what we can do, we can let u equal to cos of x. And this gives me du is equal to minus sine of x dx. Now everything with the minus sign is coming uh, out of this because I have sine x dx on the end. So let's put the minus sign out front. I get one minus u squared times u squared du, which is equivalent to u squared minus u to the four du. And life is pretty good now, right? Because this is just a polynomial. I get u cubed over three uh, minus u to the five over five plus c. And the last thing with substitution, I always say it, no one asked us about u, they asked us about x. So this is actually cos cubed of x over three minus cos to the five of x over five 
plus C. And I realized as I was writing that I forgot some minus signs. So I apologize. We're going to have to throw some minuses out front of everything. And that was coming from the minus from the DU substitution. Uh, so I apologize for that, but I hope that we, we caught it before I did maybe. Okay, let me give you another one, right? So that was with case one. Let me give you one with case two. So example two here, let's simplify cos to the five of x dx. We're gonna do exactly the same thing. We're going to expand this into an even power of cosine multiplied by just cosine by itself. And now we use that Pythagorean substitution. So we get this. And of course, we've got a nice uh, substitution that we need to do here. Let's say let u equal to sine of x. And this gives me du is equal to cos of x dx. Now we can see cos of x is coming out. It's right here. And so things aren't so bad for us, right? So what we have is an integral of one minus u squared squared du. And there's no negative in this case because sine just differentiates into cosine. We can expand that out. And this gives us one minus two u squared plus u to the four du. And this is a beautiful little substitution or this is a, a beautiful little integral because it's so easy, right? It's just a nice little um, polynomial. So I got u minus two thirds u cubed plus u to the five over five plus c. And you can hear me in your head saying it. No one asked us about u, they asked us about x. So don't forget to back substitute here. So sine of x minus two thirds sine cubed of x uh, plus one fifth sine to the five of x and then plus c. So that's pretty cool, right? We got a polynomial of sine functions as our solution here. Okay, so that covers case two. So, you know, we are logical, we are uh, smart people watching this. So you can probably guess that I'm going to give you a, a case three example next. So let's do uh, sine squared cos to the four. Okay, in this case, you're gonna substitute for sine squared and cos squared. Now cos to the four is the same as cos squared all squared. So I'm gonna use those substitutions that I put up, maybe just so this doesn't get messy, I'll put it down here. And I get uh, one minus cos of two X divided by two times one plus cos of two X divided by two squared dx. Okay, now it's, it's, it looks a little ugly, but it's not too bad. Let's first take out a lot of the, uh, uh, all of the over two. So over two and then over two squared, that gives me over eight. And so then uh, I'm left with one minus cos squared, or sorry, cos two x, I'm sorry. And then one, plus two cos two x plus cos squared of two x uh, dx, of course. Okay, uh, you know, it's not too, too bad. It's a polynomial in cos, uh, cosines, but at least it's all the same trigonometric function. And so now if I expand this thing out, I'll go ahead and expand it and simplify it in one step. So I get one plus cos of two x and then um, minus cos squared of two x and then minus cos cubed of two x. And this is all dx. Now, ignoring the cos squared and the cos cubed, I can actually solve the beginning part of this, right? I don't even need to do any substitutions really. Uh, the first two terms simplify really nicely. So they become x and then plus one half sine of two x. If you want to, you can do the substitution for two x. There's no shame in it. Take it slow, but I'm going to go ahead and do that step all at once. 
And now I have a cos of 2x uh, and I have a cos cubed of 2x. Okay, so now, you know, again, I use this analogy all the time, but it's the Russian dolls again, right? They, this, the, we found more examples of cases two and three in here, or yeah, cases two and three in here. So first of all, let's call this integral number one, we'll solve that. And then we will solve this one, number two. So starting with number one. Okay, so what did we get? We got something with an even power of cosines on it. So we can substitute or we can replace cos squared again using the same identity that we used to replace cos squared before. So this gives me, I'll pull the one half outside of the integral to make it look a little prettier. And then the numerator of that is one plus cos. And originally it was 2x. But in this case, now I've already got 2x. I double the angle again. I've got 4x. And here, now I've got a single power of cosine. I can do this, right? This gives me 1 half and then all times x and then plus 1 over 4 sine of 4x. I'm not going to put the plus c's in yet. I'll put it all in at the end because there's only 1 plus c. But that's good, right? That's not too bad. Uh, that was relatively simple. Let's do cos cubed now. Now we have the integral of cos cubed of 2x dx. So this is now a case two integral. We can use that Pythagorean identity to get one minus sine squared of 2x. And then uh, that's still multiplied by cos of 2x dx. In this case, we're going to substitute for sine of 2x. So let u equal to sine of 2x. And then du is equal to 2 cos of 2x, because we have that 2 inside of the, the sine and the cosine functions. And so dividing off the 2 leaves us with a factor of 1 half that's coming out from that substitution of du. And now I've got one minus u squared du. That's a nice, simple integral. I can handle that. And so here now I get one half and, uh, and u minus u cubed over three, which leaves me with one half. And then the substitution was sine of two x minus one third sine cubed of two x. So I can put this all together and I get that the integral of sine squared of x cos to the four of x dx is equal to, so I'm going to factor out the one half that came from every single term here. So multiplying that by the one eighth leaves me with a factor of one sixteenth kicking out front. And after uh, simplifying everything, I get, one quarter sine of four X uh, and then plus one third sine cubed of two X. So uh, plus C of course, of course, I forgot my own rule there almost. So that's beautiful, right? That's a, th we have this sort of nesting where things get uh, slightly simpler as we start using the identities and we start boiling things down to uh, maybe cases one or two from the relatively hard case of case three. Okay, let me give you an example of something that wasn't in this list. So, you know, if we look at what I gave you originally here, I said M and N have to be integers you know, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, so on and so forth. What if I give you like a square root or something weird? Well, it's most of the time it's infeasible. But let me show you an example where, um, where trigonometric identities might be able to help you. Well, they will be able to help you. So like I said, there's not really a cookbook or like a recipe for a lot of these things. A lot of it is just seeing what 
trigonometric identities might be able to help you. So I give you the integral. It's going to be a definite one, just so we can illustrate how to work with definite integrals. And let's take the, let's take one plus cos of four X all under the square root. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we are going to use the uh, double angle identity. So we've already seen this. We saw that cos squared of theta, I'll use theta as a placeholder, is equal to one plus cos of two theta divided by two, which if you rearrange that, it gives you one plus cos of two theta is equal to co two cos squared of theta. And in our case, let's let theta equal to two X so that I've got one plus cos of four X on the, on the left-hand side. And so now I didn't do any substitution. This is a trigonometric identity. The function is exactly the same. Nothing got substituted for, so the bounds aren't gonna change. But now I've got two cos squared, two X in here, DX, which leaves me with a square root of two out front. And now naively, most people are just gonna say, well, the, the square and the square root cancel each other out. But those who are really, really paying attention, they know that when you take the square root of a square, you technically get the absolute value back. Now, for those of us who did not think to do this, uh, you are right by accident in this case, because on the interval zero to pi over four, cosine is a positive function. So maybe let's put this in a, a little marker here. So cos two X is actually greater than or equal to zero for X in the interval zero to pi over four. Okay, so if we forgot to put the absolute value in there, we're lucky in this case because it didn't, it's not, it doesn't actually matter. So that gives us that this is really just an integral of the cosine function. Which this is something I can handle, right? This gives me the square root of two and then one half sine of two X all running from zero to pi over four, which in this case gives me root two over two. So that's taking the factor of one half out front. And then I get sine of pi over two, which is equal to one. And I get sine of zero, which is equal to zero. So maybe we can just put a little note. This is equal to one, this is equal to zero. And boom, root two over two. So, if you think about this, potentially before this, before you just saw this, you would look at that integral and go, that thing is ridiculous, right? There's no way that I'm ever gonna be able to, to solve this. But it turns out, you know, you just have to be clever. There's all of these trigonometric identities that can help you work through these things. And, you know, it's not always immediately obvious which ones are going to work. Uh, so it takes a little bit of trial and error. Like I said, there's not a cookbook. There's not a recipe for this. Um, but there are some general principles like what we saw with the previous examples of powers and sines and cosines. Now, those of us who know our trigonometric identities very, very well, they know that there's a version of the Pythagorean identity for tan and secant. So let me ask you to recall that tan squared of X is equal to secant squared of x plus one. All this is, is taking the usual sine squared plus uh, uh, cos squared is equal to one and just dividing everything by cos squared. That's all it is, right? Uh, secant squared is one over cos squared. It's exactly the same identity. Uh, but, uh, sorry, there's a minus one here, pardon me, which is the same as saying, uh, sorry, secant squared of x is equal to tan squared of x plus one, pardon me. 
But that means that we can handle powers of, of tans and secants together as well. And they basically fall into the same strategy as what we started with, with powers of sines and cosines mixed together. So let me show you another example. Let's imagine you were asked to find the antiderivative of tan to the 4x. Well, in this case, you can split up one of the tan squareds. Well, you can split this up into two tan squareds, I'm sorry, but one of them can become secant squared minus one. So we get secant squared minus one. Okay, now let's go ahead and expand out that derivative here, or sorry, that integrand. So I get tan squared of x secant squared of x dx. Let's leave that as one integral that we can work with. And then I've got the integral of tan squared of x dx right out back. Now, the first integral is going to be a pain. So let's leave it for a moment. But we know that tan squared is secant squared minus one. So this becomes the integral of secant squared x minus one dx, which not terrible. Again, let's leave the beginning part here. I haven't looked at it yet. I don't want to look at it yet. It looks a little ugly for me. But essentially now tacked on the back is the antiderivative or the integral of secant squared plus the integral of one. Now, those pieces tacked on the back are not bad at all. Now, you'll probably remember that the antiderivative of secant squared is tan itself. So that's good, right? And of course, the antiderivative of one is x. Okay, so that's, that part was the easy part. What do I do with the piece that remains, right? So I haven't put the plus C on the end because I'll put it on the end at the very end once I do all of the integrals. But again, I can use my knowledge that secant squared is the derivative of tan of X. I can see a little secant squared here. So why don't I try this? Say let U equal to tan of X, just one of them, not both of them. Then du is equal to secant squared x dx. And this tells me, I think I forgot to put a, d, a dx on the end here, but this whole piece, the secant squared dx becomes my du. And this is equal to u squared du. And then the tan x and the x on the end, I've already taken care of. And life is good again, right? I got a polynomial. I love polynomials. They always make my life easy. And so we can see we have a mixture of u's and x's. So of course, we want to get back into x's. So we get this nice little chain. So I just want to pause here and, and mention something. Sometimes people think of trigonometric identities as some sort of like magic transformation of a function. And you, you know, it's like, oh, how was I supposed to think of that? I, I, you know, this is way too hard. Um, like, you know, and then you, you introduce a, a trigonometric identity and the function looks completely different. Everything is completely out the window. I don't like to think of it that way. I like to think of trigonometric identities as sort of undoing a disguise that a function has on, right? It might look really, really complicated, but trigonometric identities tell you, it's actually not, right? You were just making it, or it was just presented to you in probably the worst possible way. You should always think of trigonometric identities that way, especially with these, these uh, integral problems. They are allowing you to sort of take the mask off a really complicated function. And you can see that happening. Look at this chain of equalities on the board. Um, I took a really hard integral, at least on the surface, tan to the four of x. I have no idea what the antiderivative of that thing is. But through a series of fairly simple uh, manipulations, I now know exactly what the antiderivative of tan to the four of x is. You can see it right here. 
So that's uh, pretty interesting in my opinion. Okay, so let's do another one then. Let me show you another example. This time we'll use a secant power. So secant cubed of x. Okay, well, what can we do here? Well, let me show you something. We learned a new trick last video. And what we can see here, or at least after looking at it for maybe a little while or a long while, I can see a function secant and I can see a derivative of a function secant squared, right? I never think of secant squared as being its own function. I always think of this as being the derivative of tan because that's where it comes out most of the time. So let's use integration by parts. If we set u is equal to secant of x, then this tells me v prime is equal to secant squared of x. And that tells me v is equal to tan of x. And that tells me uh, that du is equal to secant of x, tan of x. So the derivative of secant. I might have mixed up my u's and v's from last time. It doesn't really matter how you name them. You can switch u's and v's around. Um, maybe it's a good thing that I'm switching them around just so you really, uh, so it drives that home. But, uh, but it, it, it doesn't matter with the integration by parts. Just one is a derivative, one is not. But then using integration by parts, this tells me that this integral, secant times secant squared, is u times v, so secant of x times tan of x, minus the integral of v times the derivative of u. So that is tan of x times secant of x times tan of x dx. Now you can see I've got a tan squared in there. And so what am I going to do? I'm going to substitute for secant or for secant squared, pardon me. So I'm going to use the Pythagorean identity again. And look at how cool this one becomes. So in this case, I get tan squared, which is equal to secant squared of x minus one times secant of x dx. And let me expand that out just so you can see how awesome this is actually going to be. We get the integral of secant cubed of x dx plus the integral of secant of x dx. Okay, so, so on the surface, you're looking at it, you're thinking, Jason, that's totally useless, right? What was the point? Uh, we got back what we started with, right? But we saw this in the last video too. We saw that this is what happens sometimes with these integration by parts problems. And that's fine. We can pull that secant cubed over to the other side. So this tells us that when we pull this secant cubed over, we get two of them on the left. So we get two antiderivative or integral of secant cubed dx is equal to secant of x tan of x plus the integral of just straight secant dx, which you might have to dig deep into the recesses of your mind to remember what the integral of secant of x is, but it is one that's sort of well known uh, to some extent, maybe not to you just on in your memory, but it is something we can easily look up. Uh, so let me start on the next page. We divide off a factor of two, this tells me that the integral of secant cubed dx is equal to one half and then secant x tan x and then one half of the antiderivative of secant, which is ln of the absolute value of secant of x plus tan of x. So that's a pretty ugly one. Uh, but I'll give it to you just in here, right? And that's one that we can look up if we ever need to reference it. Okay. So far, we've seen a power just on tan and a power just on secant. So of course, we might as well do another example where we, we have seen uh, powers on secant and tan together, right? Let's mix and match. 
So when I think of trigonometric functions, I always like to think of them in pairs. I, and in particular, there's two pairs that stand out to me. Sine and cosine, of course, right? Sine and cosine are brother and sister. They come together all the time. But tan and secant, I think of as, as the cousins, right? They're the other, the sibling cousins to sine and cosine. They always come together. And it, you've seen it, right? Look at the derivatives and the antiderivatives of these functions. They sort of go back and forth between each other. Okay, so what is it that we're gonna do here? Same trick every time, Pythagorean identity, right? So I'm going to use the Pythagorean identity to simplify one of those secants. So I get, or sorry, one of the secant squares. So I get tan squared of X, and I get secant squared of x. So what I did was I took secant to the four and turned it into secant squared and secant squared. And then one of the secant squareds I turned into one plus tan x. Okay, let's multiply it out. And I'm going to multiply out the tans. I got tan to the four of x. I think you can see what's coming. Tan to the six of x, secant squared, you can see that secant squared is going to be great, right? Because what I can do now is I can substitute. I can say let u equal to tan of x. And that tells me du is equal to secant squared of x dx. And so here it is just right there sitting out back. So now life is good, a nice polynomial for me to integrate. Nothing hard anymore, right? This is something we can do in our sleep by now. And the final piece of this is putting everything back in terms of X. So one fifth, 10 to the five of X plus one seventh, 10 to the seven of X plus C. Okay, so I've shown you how to take care of powers, right? So we have powers in terms of um, uh, sines and cosines together. Uh, we even saw an example of a square root, but that one doesn't generalize very well. Um, and then we saw powers in terms of tans and secants. Now what we can ask ourselves is what happens if we have products of sines and cosines? So in this case, I'm going to ask you to recall some trigonometric identities again. So for example, if I have sine of m times x times sine of n times x, so some multiples of x inside of these things, and ideally m and n are not gonna be the same number so that this can't make like a square, for example. Well, the first identity says this is cos of, uh, m minus n times x minus cos of m plus n times x. Okay, so now what I did is I separated out a product of sines and cosines into a sum of cosines. Similarly, if we have sine of m times x times cos of n times x, so sine times cosine, then I get a sum of sine functions. So I get m minus n times x, and then I get sine of m plus n times x. And of course, there's a third one, and that's when I multiply two cosines together. And in this case, you get a sum of cosines again. So I get cos of m minus n times x plus cos of m plus n times x. So the real beauty of this statement says that if you multiply two uh, sine or cosine functions or, or one of each together and they have different sort of insides, right? One could be three x and one could be 17 x. You can just turn that into a sum and I can integrate that, that sum any day of the week. That's pretty easy in my opinion. So let me, let me wrap up with a final example here. Example number eight. 
And how about I ask you to find the antiderivative or the integral of sine of 3x cos of 5x dx? Well, let's just put a little mark down here. This is number two with, so I mean like number two right here, if you want, if you want to put some numbers on these things. It's number two with m equal to three and n equal to five. So really, this one doesn't take a whole lot of thinking, right? It's literally just applying a trigonometric identity. So this gives me one half that comes from applying the identity. And then the integral here now becomes a sum of signs. So I get sine of m minus n, that's minus two x. And then plus sine of m plus n, that's eight x. Okay, now sine is an odd function. It means that I can take that negative uh, in front of the two and I can pull it outside. So let me write this nicer. I get sine of eight X because that's the positive one. I want it to go first and then minus sine of two X DX. And now we're in a position where we can apply just straight integration techniques. So multiplying through the one half into the factor of one over eight, that's gonna come out here. I get minus one over 16 cos eight X and then plus uh, one quarter sine of two X plus C. Uh, sorry, the last one is a cosine, not a sine. I got uh, too excited. But there you have it, right? This one, this case is definitely the easiest of all of them. And it, it's just because it turns a product into a sum. So there you have it, right? That's that's trigonometric uh, substitute or trigonometric uh, integration, uh, at least in some isolated examples. Again, I just wanna reiterate, uh, we don't have some sort of unified theory. There's not like some prescription that I can write you to tell you exactly what needs to be done. But at least with some of the examples that we saw today, we saw there are general methods that allow you to take care of certain types of integrals. Now we'll encounter other ones as we go through, and we're gonna to continue to talk about integration techniques through the next few videos. But in this case, you know, now we have a new tool at our disposal and new ways to evaluate integrals involving trigonometric functions.